podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on Safeguarding Children of Arrested Parents, Implementing the Model Arrest Policy. Um, my name is Sherry Hoffman. I am the chairperson of the Interagency Working Group on Youth Programs, and I work um, at the Department of Health and Human Services here in Washington, D.C., and in partnership with the American Institutes for Research and our partners, um, from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinqu Delinquency Prevention, we're really excited to bring you this information today. So welcome, and I want to give you a little bit of background um, on the working group that I just mentioned, and then introduce our panelists, and we'll get going. So um, the Interagency Working Group on Youth Programs um, is a collaborative effort of over 20 different federal agencies and offices across the whole government that have direct youth programming. And back in 2008, under an executive order from then President George W. Bush, we were directed, um, HHS was asked to chair a working group that would bring all of those agencies together and coordinate and collaborate to improve youth outcomes. We were also tasked to operate a website that would be a one-stop shop for information about federal um, youth programming and resources across the government. And we've been doing that for about the last 10 years at uh, www.youth.gov. Um, and also, we have uh, just recently relaunched a youth-facing portion of that website known as Youth Engage for Change, which you can find at engage.youth.gov. So I encourage you to go there and get a little bit of a sense of all of the things that are happening um, across the federal government for youth. Um, youth.gov is really aimed at uh, adults who work with youth, um, and you can find lots of information there about different um, issues that young people might be facing, resources. We have a funding center there where you can learn about opportunities for federal funding um, and information about evidence-based programs and all kinds of different things. So check that out. Um, this work that we are bringing to you today comes from a partnership that we have, as I mentioned, with OJJDP, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, where as part of youth.gov, we host um, a microsite on children of incarcerated parents and have had a really robust um, strong stream of work over the past couple of years, um, learning about uh, issues that are particular to children who have or have had an incarcerated parent, and really trying to think about how we can best serve um, those young people, what their unique needs are. Um, so you can find that uh, website also at youth.gov. Um, and we've done a couple of things over the last few years with a, a listening session with about 20 young people um, who have had have or have had an incarcerated parent and having an opportunity to hear from them about how that has impacted them and what sort of changes um, and, and policy changes and practice changes would be helpful to them. We've also, from that work, been able to develop some resources for um, teachers and for social workers that you would find um, on the, the Children of Incarcerated Parents microsite. So I encourage you to take a look at that. But today we're going to be talking specifically about the issue of um, arrest and how witnessing the arrest influences uh, a young person. And I want to go ahead and introduce our panel to you. Um, the folks that, will, that we'll be hearing from today all have a, a different um, angle that they can share their experience with. So we're really looking forward to it. We'll be starting with Savannah, who is a youth living in New York, who experienced the arrest of her father. And she's here today to share her lived experience with us, which we really appreciate. So welcome, Savannah, and thank you. Juliette Marie D'Souza is a senior researcher at the American Institutes for Research, who is our partner in operating youth.gov. And her work focuses on social emotional factors and wraparound services, programs and policies necessary to improve outcomes for youth. And a main topic area of her work through our working group are these issues pertaining to children of incarcerated parents. Rebecca Schlafer is an assistant professor and developmental psychologist at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Schlafer's research focuses on understanding the developmental outcomes of children and families with multiple risk factors. She's particularly interested in children with parents in prison, as well as the programs and policies that impact families affected by incarceration. Brendan Cox is the former chief of police in Albany, New York, who is at the forefront of developing and implement, implementing 
the International Association of Chiefs of Police model arrest policy in Albany, and he continues to be an advocate for trauma-informed practice. And Katie Clark is the anti-violence coordinator for the Albany, New York Police Department. She handles initiatives such as the IACP model arrest policy and something called Handle with Care, which is a collaboration between the police force and the school system to support youth who experience a traumatic experience outside of school and bridging what happens at home and school. So this is a great lineup of folks to talk to you about this issue of uh, witnessing arrest. And I'm going to hand it over to Juliet Marie D'Souza at AIR to get us started. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Sherry. Um, so as Sherry said, my name is Juliet Marie D'Souza and I'm working at the American Institutes for Research. And we're glad to have you all on today's webinar. Um, we're gonna start today with Savannah who is a young lady who we're lucky enough to have on our panel today. Um, and she's willing to share her story with us um, of what she has experienced. So Savannah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, to start, um, would you please tell us a little bit about your experience in witnessing an arrest? And of course, just a reminder, you know, you can share uh, what you feel comfortable sharing and, and leave out anything you don't. Hi, my name is Savannah, and this is a little bit about my personal experience. My dad had a warrant for his arrest, and the police came to my house while I was home on a school break and arrested him. It seemed like there were so many police officers were in my house, but my mom said there were only five police officers. I remember a woman police officer who was very mean and wouldn't let my mom take me out of the apartment or let me say anything to my dad. And then another officer said, let her come hug her dad so she knows he's okay. And I ran hugging him so tight until my mom said I had to let him go. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Savannah. Um, can nope. you tell us um, how long you think you felt the impact of your father's arrest and if you still feel that way? Um, I felt this impact for probably like the whole time. It was hard dealing with it too. And do you do you still feel the impact? And and how did that affect you before? I know you mentioned that sometimes you would replay that day over in your head. Yeah, at least until my dad came home a year later. I remember I would be in school thinking about it, or when I was home, it would just pop into my head and make me upset. I hated seeing how rude the police were to my dad. And what helped you cope during that and after the arrest? Um, hugging my dad would help. My mom explained to me what was going on. I would talk to my therapist about my feelings, talking to my dad every day so I knew he was okay, having people there for me whenever I needed to, like my mentor, Roz. That's great. That's great to know that you had all of that support with your mom and your therapist and being able to talk to your dad. Um, and then your mentor as well. So those supports sound like they were very helpful for you. Um, can you share three things that maybe could have made the experience different for you? I really wish the police would have been nicer to me or not getting held back from hugging my dad or if they would let me out my house when I was, if they would have let me out the house when my mom was trying to get me out. Okay, yeah, so those are all things that could have made the experience um, different for you. Um, well, thank you so much, Savannah, for t uh, sharing your story with us and starting us off. Um, hearing your voice on this topic is really helpful for all of us. Um, thank you. And um, we know you're staying on the webinar, so if folks have questions for you um, at the end, um, we'll be passing those questions on to you to answer. But thank you again. Thank you. And sure. So we know that certain events like this happen, but hearing it firsthand 
a firsthand account like what we just heard from Savannah is really valuable and powerful for understanding the impact um, that an experience like this can have. And unfortunately, Savannah's story has played out many times when the parent of a child is arrested. Because the arrest of a parent can be a traumatic experience and have a traumatic impact on children of all ages, in 2013, the Department of Justice announced that the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the IACP, along with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is within the Department of Justice, that they would develop a model protocol and training on protecting the physical and emotional well-being of children when their parents are arrested. On the IACP website, one can find a toolkit about this model arrest policy. The materials available include a policy document, training videos, classroom resources such as a facilitator guide and a PowerPoint, a tip sheet, and a checklist with items for police officers to consider before arrest while they're preparing to go make that arrest and then during the arrest. Um, stuff such as looking for signs that a child may be present. Perhaps there's a toy or a coloring book that's out in the, in the room that they notice. So there are lots of materials on that website um, to, to assist police in learning how to deal with um, a, an arrest. The importance of this tool is uh, based on the scope of the problem. We know that 50 to 60% of incarcerated adults are parents. An estimated 2.7 million children have a parent who is in prison or jail. And we know that parental incarceration rates, especially for mothers, has been increasing. We know that nearly 50% of children exposed to family violence witness an arrest. And that having an incarcerated parent is known to be an adverse childhood experience. An adverse childhood experience, or an ACE, is the term used to describe all types of abuse, neglect, and other potentially traumatic experiences that occur to people under the age of 18. Adverse childhood experiences have been linked to risky health behaviors, chronic health conditions, low life potential, and even early death. So as the number of ACEs increases, so does the risk for these outcomes. Therefore, Having policies and procedures in place that can reduce that can reduce the likelihood of a child experiencing trauma or an ACE is vital. So, with that brief introduction to today's to today's topic, I would like to pass this off to Dr. Rebecca Schlafer, who's going to tell us more about what the research says. Rebecca, thanks, Juliet. I'm excited to be with you today. I don't want to spend too much time here reviewing some of the data, but I do think it's important context. So what we know, and this is data that come from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in 2007, it was estimated that nearly 1.75 million children had a parent incarcerated in a state or federal prison. Between 1991 and mid-year 2007, parents held in state and federal prisons increased by 79%. And it was estimated then that 52% of adults in state prisons and 63% of adults in federal prisons were parents with minor children. Of course, these data reflect only parents that were currently incarcerated at the time of the survey. And at this point now, they're more than a decade old. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a more recent report from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, but strong evidence suggests that millions of children are impacted by their parents' incarceration each year. Indeed, more recent data from the National Survey of Children's Health estimates that approximately 5 million children have experienced the incarceration of a parent that they lived with. Either way, it's fair to say that millions of children experience the incarceration of their parent and an experience that is really uniquely American at this point. So when we think about witnessing a parent's arrest, we know that this can be considered an incarceration-related experience. Scholars in this area have made a distinction between general environmental risks, things like poverty or parent education homelessness, things that we know are factors that are associated with one's risk for incarceration and also may be related to adverse child outcomes. But we also can think about incarceration-related experience or 
or incarceration specific risk factors. And these may be things like witnessing a parent's criminal activity, witnessing a parent's arrest, or witnessing or participating in, a, in the court process or the parent's sentencing. And these, th these exposures, um, again, referred to as incarceration-related experiences, are thought to have uh, particularly stressful or traumatic experiences for children whose parents will later go on to be incarcerated. Uh, Danielle Dallaire and her colleague um, have talked about uh, parental arrest particularly, and they wrote, the context of parental arrest more so than the actual arrest may be particularly frightening for children. And if we can think about what's happening in this context of parental arrest, we know that there's a lot that may be going on, including uh, a child's exposure to criminal activities, uh, substance use, drugs and alcohol, and the environment in and of itself is often chaotic, loud, there's generally uh, a level of unpredictability that the parents have and sometimes the arresting officers and certainly the children um, experience. There may be verbal altercations that happen before and during the arrest as well as violence and exposure to weapons. And so what Delaire and Wilson mean here, right, is that this idea of it's not just the actual arrest, but all of the context that may set children up for having um, poor experiences in this context. So I'm a developmental psychologist, which means I have to think about this from a lens of children's age and their developmental capacity. And I think this is really important to keep in mind when we think about how a parent's arrest may affect children. So the data that are presented on this slide here, again, come from the Bureau of Justice Statistics and reflect the age of children with parents that were currently incarcerated in state or federal prisons at the time of that survey. What you can see here is that approximately 2% of, of children were less than one year old. About 20% are between one and four years old. 30% are between the ages of five and nine years old. 32% are between 10 and 14 years old, and about 16% are between 15 and 17 years old. If you take this graphic at full, what we can see is that more than 75% of these kids are school age, but or between the ages of five and 17 years. And this becomes really important when we think about opportunities for intervention. And so, as we heard in the beginning, um, the investment in thinking about uh, approaching schools and teachers and having that be one source of support for kids who've experienced their parents' arrest is really important because many of these youth are spending substantial portions of their days uh, at school. And the arrest, of course, could bleed over or impact their uh, functioning and their experiences at school. So of course, we know that kids have different experiences and understanding of something like an arrest or all experiences really, depending on their age and their developmental capacities. So consider the differences, for example, and what an infant, let's say a six month old would experience versus what a 16 year old would experience in terms of a parent's arrest, even if all of the other facts about the situation were exactly the same. I like to think about this in considering domains of child development or things that we think about in terms of emotional development, cognitive and language development, social, de social development, and physical development. And I wanna walk you all through uh, this slide here a little bit and think about it particularly in the context of a child's exposure to their parents' arrest. So when we think about emotional development, we're thinking about things like emotional expression and regulation. So in the context of a parent's arrest, this could be a child screaming or crying, but of course we know this depends highly on the child's age. So again, if we can use that extreme example of what a six month old might experience versus what a 16 year old might experience, right? Uh, they, mo but they both may cry in the same situation in terms of the arrest, but the infant is likely going to be crying because the auditory stimuli or the noise in the environment is very scary or because they're no longer being held by their primary caregiver, that emotional reaction might be very high. Um, we can think about emotional reactivity for a 16-year-old too, but it would look quite different, of course. When we think about cognitive and language skills, what becomes important here is in terms of what children understand or what they don't understand about the situation. Of course, what they may remember, what they have the capacity to, to remember, because of course we know that uh, young children, while they have memories, uh, it often gets uh, 
held in their being in different ways than older kids. And so while a 10 year old may be able to uh, recite all of the experiences of what happened when their parent was arrested, a three year old may have very different mem memories and may be able to express only limited details about that time. And of course, we know that language skills make a difference here in terms of what kids can say um, or share about whether or not they're scared. They may have language or not language skills or not to be able to ask questions about what's going on, where their parent is going. They may or may not have the language skills to be able to express their desire with whom they want to go to when their parent is arrested um, or make plans for younger siblings. And so these these cognitive and language skills become really important in thinking about what a child's capacity is and how they will experience the arrest of their parents. We can think about the same things in terms of social development too, uh, with regard to thinking about who are children's primary caregivers and their social relationships. So for example, for a very young child, being separated from their primary caregiver or attachment figure has really devastating consequences. And so even a short separation for a couple of days from the primary caregiver can be very difficult for, a, for an infant or young child, particularly for that child not being able to understand what's going on. Of course, that separation is challenging and traumatic for older children as well, but they have the language and cognitive skills to be able to uh, talk to other adults in their life about what's going on, to have some understanding of the circumstances and when their parent is coming back. And so those are important considerations to keep in mind as well. And then we can think about physical development and how it plays into this picture in terms of experiencing a parent's arrest. For example, depending on the age of the child, they may be able to physically run away. They may be able to physically fight back in terms of uh, if, a, if a, an arresting officer moves into uh, their bedroom or an area, they may um, be seen as a threat to the police depending on the age of the child, for example. In the example uh, that Savannah gave, we heard about her ability to physically run and hug her father and what that meant to her. And so I think um, all of these sort of domains of development become really important in thinking about what a child experiences in the context of their parents' incarceration. What's challenging for us as scientists is to really understand how many children with incarcerated parents have witnessed their parents' arrest, in large part because our estimates vary widely. Um, and this body of literature in terms of parental incarceration uh, has really grown rapidly over the last 10 years, but is still quite small in the grand scheme of, of science and what we need to know. So estimates, as I said, um, on the number of children who have witnessed parental arrest vary greatly. There was a paper in 1995, for example, that suggested that only 20% of children had experienced their parents' arrest. And another one by Kampner and colleagues that suggested that of 30 of 36 child participants in their study, um, 83% of them, so 30 of the 36 participants, um, were able to talk about, they had indicated that they witnessed their parents' arrest, and they also retained very vivid memories of that arrest years later. And so those um, sort of dated studies at this point suggest anywhere from 20 to 83% of kids may experience this. But more recent data with a more narrow um, age range of kids in some cases gives us a little bit more insight into this. We are also realizing too that it really matters in some cases who we ask as, as researchers about whether or not the child uh, experienced this uh, arrest. So Delaire and Wilson in 2010, for example, in their um, study with 95 parents, about half fathers and half mothers, who were incarcerated in a regional jail, um, found that about 38% of fathers and 21% of mothers reported that the, their child had witnessed their arrest. And those were children between the ages of 7 and 17 years old. A later study by Delaire and colleagues looked at a much uh, larger sample, uh, but focused exclusively on mothers, so 236 mothers that were inc incarcerated across six different jail settings. And they looked at uh, kids in middle childhood, so six to 12 years old. Uh, about 33% witnessed their mother's arrest, and 8.3%, even though the study was focused on incarcerated mothers, 8.3% um, of children in that sample had also witnessed a father's arrest at some point. 
And more recent data um, from my team uh, looking at uh, 315 fathers that were across, incarcerated across four jails in two Midwestern states looked at kids between the ages of um, three and 17 years old and found that about a quarter of the fathers reported that the child witnessed their arrest. Um, this is important to think about in the context of um, where there might be opportunities for intervention. And I think we're going to have um, a great conversation as we move forward here about these model arrest policies becoming one way that we can intervene and intervene early to support families during this traumatic experience, particularly considering that data suggests that at least one in four kids and very likely more have experienced um, this trauma. What we know too is that witnessing the parents' arrest has really important implications for child adjustment and well being. Um, so, Dallaire and Wilson wrote that exposure to these incarceration related experiences was associated with emotional difficulties, including anxiety, depression, uh, kids demonstrating less emotion regulation skills, as well as problems with vocabulary, which may make it difficult for school. And so, again, we see that this, this one experience can have ripple effects into kids' adjustment. In other settings. We also know that exposure to incarceration specific risks like arrest is strongly associated with other internalizing and externalizing behavior problems. And that, by that we mean internalizing symptoms like anxiety, depression, withdrawal, and externalizing behavior problems like acting out or delinquency or getting into trouble. And we see that these effects in some of these studies um, are happening for internalizing and externalizing behavior problems over and above the general environmental risks that I mentioned at the beginning, including poverty and parent education. Um, so these can have this particular exposure to this really um, highly emotional and traumatic experience can have really uh, important consequences for kids' future development. And then, of course, as we're moving forward here, thinking about this idea that model arrest policies that really aim to develop and consider uh, kids' needs and where they're at developmentally um, acknowledge that witnessing a parent's arrest is often a traumatic experience and that with the right um, sensitive and responsiveness and really getting at a kid's uh, developmental level can really help uh, mitigate some of this stress response and the trauma exposure. So with that, I will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. I appreciate that. So uh, I'm Brendan Cox. So I am uh, I am retired from the Albany Police Department. Um, I left the police department in 2017. Um, and when I retired, I was the chief and we were able to ultimately implement um, a policy around safeguarding children. And with the policy, we did training and we ultimately came up with a strategic goal that our safeguarding policy worked into. Um, so it was really interesting how our policy and our thinking worked into a strategic goal and then ultimately worked into how a number of things changed and how we ultimately utilized what we were doing to, to also change the culture and to make sure we were doing it. And I want to kind of start out with, uh, you know, just thanking Savannah and highlighting um, hearing from somebody who witnessed the parents' arrest and have, having uh, Savannah tell us about what she was feeling and some of the things she still thinks back to because, you know, one of the things as, as police and as a law enforcement executive you know, we have to recognize that what might seem routine to us is not routine to other people, especially children, especially folks that we're supposed to make sure that um, we, we protect. Um, and if we're going to make sure that we are in fact protecting them, that there are ways that we can do that. And there are ways we can make sure that we operate in a fashion and our officers operate in a fashion that we're not just looking at everything that's routine and we're, we're actually taking steps um, to make sure we do that. So one of those steps can be um, implementing a policy and training and procedures to make sure that our officers don't look at things as routine because many of our officers, as we talk through this, um, in fact, probably don't have children of their own um, when they first come on. And I can use myself as an example. I got hired in 1994. Um, I was 23 years old. Um, I didn't have any children of my own at that point in time. I certainly had nieces and nephews, but if, uh, you know, if you really look at brain development and you'll look at a whole lot of other factors, um, in many ways, you know, I was closer of an age to many of the kids that were um, present that I was responding to calls than I was to some of the older officers on the job. So 
you know, we have to think of those things as we're doing things. So when we talk about safeguarding children and we talk about what the International Associations of Chiefs of Police and DJ have been able to do and some of the resources that are there, um, you know, first we have to talk about like what is our overall purpose when it comes to not only the policy, but when it comes to the, the training and um, really trying to change that culture. And when we talk about that primary policy, it is really about minimizing the trauma that's experienced by the child who's going to witness a parent's arrest and the separation caused by the arrest while maintaining the integrity of that arrest and the safety of officer suspects and other individuals. So, you know, we always talk about when we make an arrest of officers that we want to make sure that the officers are safe, the individuals that we're arresting are safe, and that we do it in a way that we can cause as little trauma as possible to everybody else. And normally, if we are able to implement this policy and do the right kind of training, we actually can increase safety. And whenever we look at things that we can do better in our communities, um, we can actually increase that safety. And when we talk about arrest, certainly we have a country where we utilize arrest more than anyone else. Um, and one of the numbers we do know is that that is true. Um, as it goes, you know, the United States has 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. So we know that ultimately we utilize arrest a lot. So we need to make sure that we're, uh, that we're doing our best to, to ensure that we're minimizing that trauma. So from an executive level, why is it important that we implement this policy? Why is it important that we minimize that, that, that trauma? Well, first of all, because it does minimize trauma, because we know that if we can respond to calls and arrests, and do it in, in the, least traumatiz the least traumatizing way that we can reduce that trauma. We also know it reduces liability, that if we put ourselves in position that we're not doing something in a, in a fashion where others might get harmed, we're gonna reduce that liability. It increases our legitimacy. Um, you know, we know through studies that if we do things that um, people understand and people can um, at least recognize that they're more likely to comply with what we do and they're more likely to understand what we do. So we know that legitimacy is a, is a true thing. We know that when folks are treated with dignity and respect, and certainly when we implement safeguarding policies and practices, we are in fact making sure we're treating people with dignity and respect um, by making sure that if children are, are there, that we try to figure out a way to do it to where the child's not present. Um, we ultimately increase our legitimacy. It creates better relationships. When we talk about policing, uh, we don't want to be policing people. We want to work together to create a create a uh, safer public. So we want to do that in partnership. So we build relationships both with outside agencies that can help us. And Katie's going to talk a little bit about some of the things we were able to do in Albany. Um, but we create better relationships with other agencies. But we also create better relationships with the community. And that's one of the things we want to do. And, uh, you know, the last reason is because it's the right thing to do. Um, at the end of the day, our job is to protect folks and to protect folks that are vulnerable. Um, and sometimes we just need to say that as the bottom line. If it's the right thing to do, then we're gonna ultimately do it. So uh, before I go a little further, I just wanna touch base on, I think I went too far. Back a second. All right, so this is what happens. I'm clicking through my thing, and this is what happens when you give me the control over. Right. So what else it does is it provides that guidelines for our officers. Forgive me for the, the tech issue. That's, that's completely on me. I have control over the, over the slides. It provides the guidelines for officers when they're answering call for service where children are pleasant, present, because ultimately we're not just talking about when we're arresting people. Remember, our officers are going on calls all the time where children are, are present. It's also about when we're going to make that arrest. But I just want to bring something else up. It's about the fact that we may have somebody in custody where we arrested them at a spot where children weren't in, at, at that location and a child might be home alone or a child might be en route to being home. So we might have arrested somebody at two o'clock in the afternoon and a child is at school and that child's gonna get brought home um, by the bus at three o'clock. So 
safeguarding policies also talk about our officers proactively saying to somebody, do you have a child at home? Is a child en route from school? What can we do to make sure that uh, an adult, somebody responsible is going to be there to make sure your child's taken care of while we finish this up? So it's about that as well. It's also about planning and executing search warrants in a way that we recognize uh, when children are present. And that's something that really helps out when we talk about tactics, because when we execute a search warrant, especially when we do it in a, in a cir circumstance where there may be um, weapons in the house, if we can make sure that we plan that and know who's supposed to be in that house, and if there's children that are going to be present, we can actually plan around when those children aren't going to be there. So that way we don't put them in harm's way. And then also that temporary placing children with caregivers due to separation. Um, so recognizing that we can help uh, really process to get a child to a safe place while we ultimately have the parent, while we process the child uh, and take care of that. So some of the resources that are available that really help you out to recognize that you do not need to start from scratch. Um, a few years ago you did, you no longer have to do that. But there are all kinds of resources from DJA and ISCP that include implementation guidelines, a model policy. Uh, there's a separate guideline for police executives that reads through not only what is available, but it also talks through um, what our responsibilities are from a legal standpoint when it comes to safeguarding individuals and when people are in our custody. There's a whole webinar series. I believe there's six webinars in and of themselves that are available that go from what it takes to implement to some of the barriers to creating partnerships so there's all kinds of resources there there is a one and a half hour online officer training that make it very easy for you to take an officer off the street for an hour and a half have them do that online training and really be able to do something that's very difficult to do because scheduling um, scheduling training is not always the easiest thing to do um, there's a, a 15 minute executive briefing for executives that folks can come in and go over very quickly what that be. And then there's that pre arrest uh, checklist that I know was, was spoken about before. So there are resources that are available. Um, they can be uh, adapted for what an agency needs, but they are out there and they're, they're available. So one of the key components for a success, successful program is really strong partnerships with community partners. And that really helps to enhance the training, better um, communication along interagency uh, inter lines, better results for children who need to be placed in temporary custody. So if we know that a child needs to be placed for two hours while you do processing, that way we don't have to necessarily remove the kid, remove the child from, from child uh, protective um, services. If we have somewhere else where there is an appropriate guardian in line. Also appropriate follow-up with the children and parent. Um, you know, we ask law enforcement to do a lot. And one of the things law enforcement certainly cannot do is step into a role where we're trying to raise children or give parental advice. Um, that's probably not appropriate for us. But there are agencies in the community that can do that. So when we partner with those agencies and we now have a situation where we've arrested a parent and a child was present, and we know that if we have the right partners in the community, we can filter that information to them and say, can you follow up with this family just to make sure they have the services, they have what they need. And that's something that can also then take some weight off of the shoulders of the parents. And we're doing that. That's not a punitive piece. That's very much a facilitating services for, for families that might need some help. Um, and I think, you know, as a, somebody who has uh, two children, uh, there's times that you do need that help. That definitely, that definitely works. And then the partnerships also help establish those written guidelines between agencies that outline those roles and responsibilities. And, you know, I can say that the Osborne Association was a huge part, uh, partner for us that helped us establish those guidelines that also helped us not have what I'll kind of term as mission creep to recognize that, like, okay, what should law enforcement do? What should social services do? What should not-for-profits do? to make sure that we are ultimately each staying in our lane, but having that communication back and forth so that way each folk, each, each of the, the different folks in the room were doing the right thing and making sure that things were getting taken care of. So partnerships are, are a really important part of uh, a, a good safeguarding policy and a good safeguarding practice. 
because it's really going beyond just a, 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 a policy. When we, we can have all the policies in the world, but we ultimately have to bring it into um, a practice. And that's one of the things that we really tried to do in, in having a strategic planning session. So, you know, one of the questions I get a lot is I get, you know, how do you get officer buy-in? And I think in today's world, you know, when we talk about officer buy-in, when I came on, it was uh, not that this was right, but we were basically told, you know, hey, this is how we do things. Don't ask questions, just do it. And I think that's a very inappropriate way to get not only buy-in, but to get compliance and to get people to do their job. I think the appropriate way to get people to do their job is for folks to have a chance to talk things out, to understand what they're doing, and to understand why they're doing it. In 1994, no one was talking about adverse childhood experiences. No one was talking about the brain science behind development of the adolescent. No one was talking about mass incarceration and why it's not a good thing that we have 2.1 million people in jails and prisons. No one was talking about a lot of mental health issues. Yet we were dealing with those and we didn't have the tools necessary. We now have a lot of those tools. And if as law enforcement executives, we're not bringing those to our officers and we're not doing it in a way that we're including the officers in that discussion and that training, then we're actually gonna be failing them. So establishing a safeguarding policy and implementing it in a way that we're training people and bringing them into the conversation and giving them the tools they need and the education, we're actually gonna make things better because we are then gonna be reducing that liability, providing an understanding of how an arrest or negative police interaction would be traumatic to a child. So, you know, when we step into the role of being a police officer and we put a uniform on and a badge and we go out on patrol as a police officer, you look at yourself as, I'm the good guy, I'm here to help. And what you don't always do is to see it from the angle of other people, about how they might see us. And as when we come into a community or answer a call for service, of the point of view of the individual that we're answering the call for. And certainly we don't think about how is everybody looking at it when we put a pair of handcuffs on somebody, especially if we're doing it in front of a child. So that training and strategic planning and making sure we're doing it in a way where we're actually changing the culture can help an officer see, okay, that's how someone else is seeing this and I can now see it through their eyes and I can now help change the way I do this. You can also provide that guidance on planning and responding to those calls for service. As I said, I was 23 years old when I became an officer. To me, interacting with an 11-year-old, I might not have known quite how to interact with an 11-year-old. And at the time in 1994, certainly police academies weren't providing that. We can now provide that. We know that we partner with the right agencies where we can provide opportunities for our officers to engage in, in proactive, positive activities with the youth of our cities so that way it's not the first time that they're dealing with a child when it's a negative interaction. Then again, we know we can increase officer safety and I can't, I can't say enough about empathy. Empathy is something that in this line of work you absolutely need, but it's also something that you can lose very easy. You can also get it back. And I certainly will admit that I lost empathy. Um, there is not too many police officers, nor are there too many nurses and doctors and teachers that I speak to that also have never, never not said that they have lost empathy at some point. Um, that is a natural thing to happen, but we need to build that empathy back up. And a safeguarding strategy can help do that because it gives the officers a point of view to let them recognize, of, to understand um, why we're doing this. So I'm gonna kinda end um, just by telling you the Albany story. So I guess I'm doing a little backwards. I'm telling you what the policies um, and resources are, and then I'm going to tell you the Albany story. So I get a call one day from um, from two people, Tanya Kruppet at Osborne and Jackie Green, who at the time was with New York State. She was uh, the Deputy, Sector, Sex, Deputy Secretary for Public Safety. And I was uh, running our detective office, and I just come out of our juvenile unit. And they said, hey, we want to talk to you about this safeguarding policy we're working on. Um, the states were working on some stuff along with ICP. Um, they explained a few things to me and they asked me what we did. And I went through a 10 minute um, talk on everything we did to safeguard children during an arrest. And at the end of what I said, they were like, wow, that's really great. That sounds awesome. Can, can you help us? Can you give us your policy and training? 
And uh, the my end of the phone went dead because I realized that we had no training and we had no policy. So in my head, we might have been doing that stuff, but we did not have a culture where we were doing that. That certainly from my stance in the juvenile unit, we were doing that. But I had 15 of 342 officers under me. So uh, to, to say that we were doing that was probably not what we were doing. So when I told them that, I confessed that we were not doing that. They said, you're not alone. Let's work on this together. So we decided that that's what we would do. So as we did that, we built out our policy, our training, our procedure, and started to build, um, started to change our culture. And one of the things we did is we had, we had um, about a year into that, we had started our, uh, our strategic planning. And we ultimately identified a goal called winning over a generation. And winning over a generation was twofold. One, one fold was the fact that we wanted to break down some of those barriers that we had between police officers and the youth in our city. Uh, and the other piece was that we wanted to, if we were ever going to make sure that the city of Albany is about 34% African-American, and I think our police department at the time was about 14 or 15% um, African-American. If we were ever to be a police department that was going to be reflective of our community, then we actually had to have people from our community want to be police officers. So if we were ever going to meet that, then first of all, we had to meet our first goal, and that was what was going to get people in our community to want to be police officers. So we recognized very quickly that this was a big piece of winning over a generation. Because if we started from the very beginning with our officers when they answered a call, when they had to make an arrest, if they did it in a way where they made sure that they were safeguarding children in those, those types of situations, that they were making, taking the extra step that they needed to take so they didn't arrest somebody in front of the child, or if they took the extra step to talk to a child and make sure that that, 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 that kid knew that this is not your fault, you did nothing wrong, we're going to let you talk to mom, we're going to let you talk to dad, we're going to help work this out, that ultimately we could help meet that goal. And that goal was ultimately not only good for the department, that goal was good for the city, that goal was good for the community, and that goal is good for that child. So that's how we helped to bring that, that along. And I am now going to turn things over to Katie Clark. And Katie, I had the pleasure of having Katie work, uh, work, work with me in Albany for a long time. And Katie was able to help bring um, this policy and practice and take it to a whole new level um, with Albany, and I'll let her explain some of those things. Thanks, Brendan. Um, my name is Katie Clark. I am the anti-violence coordinator for the Albany Police Department. Um, I have been with the department for just over 10 years. Um, I am a licensed um, master's social worker, um, so I am not a police officer, and my role with the department started as being a youth aide and carrying a caseload of um, chronic truants and other kids that were having interactions with law enforcement for a variety of reasons um, and kind of has morphed into helping to develop some programs and policies to support the youth that we interact with and also um, a whole bunch of other things that are just not related to that. So really to make this issue clearer for everybody, I think it's really important for me to explain kind of how our department is a little unique from other departments. Um, we have a couple of civilian roles, mine and then the youth aid, who are both designed to work as outreach and work in that, that area of program and policy development, youth interaction, um, and making sure that the department is staying connected to the youth. Um, we're also here to make sure that we're staying aware of some of the kind of up-and-coming issues as they relate to law enforcement, um, and, and trauma has been one of them. Um, so we started learning about ACEs um, probably five or six years ago now and have been trying to figure out the best way for law enforcement to also learn about that issue and how we can tailor that to how we work in the community. Um, both as routine patrol officers, but in dealing with victims, and then dealing with our officers and civilians as well. Um, the other benefit of, of you know, Albany is that we have two kind of non-traditional units of our police department. Um, we hold a, we have a prevention services unit that has five officers that are assigned to do outreach with kids and with adults. Um, so there are highest risk individuals, and really they're they're approaching those individuals with 
compassion um, and to give those individuals voice um, under the auspices of respect so that they can really try and understand what's at the roots of their issues and get them to make some better choices, um, access services that are available to them, um, and kind of get them out of the trajectory that they're on with those contacts with law enforcement. I'm saying all this to kind of show that the police department's been looking at this idea of how we interact with our youth and that it's not just kind of on the fun play front of recreation games and bike rodeos, but that we're, we've been trying to get to the root of the issue of, of supporting our youth and helping them um, through some of those kind of more socially based um, programs. And that's one of the reasons why we're recognized as 21st century policing site, um, because we've pushed some of that into our training. Um, and really, you know, that's kind of where our safeguarding children of arrested parents policy has gone. While we were part of the Bureau for Justice Assistance's um, development of that, that policy, we also helped with their training and, and it is our officers that are featured in that and we still train that to our officers to this day. On top of that, we started bringing a training into um, the police department. We've now trained all of our officers on child development, um, brain science, the development of the brain and how long it takes for the brain to develop and how people react during those different times, as well as the effects of trauma um, on brain development and on child development and how that can affect people's interactions with each other, with law enforcement, with their peers, with family, so that there's some context for some of the calls that our officers are going on, particularly because we have um, a very large school district um, and a number of residential treatment centers um, that we get called to often. So we wanna make sure that our officers are understanding um, the impacts that that is having and that ACEs are having on our kids because we're being called to assist in those in a number of different ways. Um, and sometimes it's frustrating to get those calls repeatedly, but when we can kind of frame it around what that kid's going through, it brings some light to it and it allows the officer to understand that the kid may not be in control of what's going on with them and their behaviors. Um, and then they can kind of take that a little differently. So we do that training in conjunction with the LaSalle School, which is one of our residential training centers here. And they're really on the forefront of um, ACE training and development. Uh, they're one of our ACE sites. And we do that so that there are both experts in the brain science, but then we do that with patrol officers so that there's a credible messenger from law enforcement for how to transmit what they're learning into what they're doing on the street each and every day. Um, and our school resource officers have gone through that, our patrol officers, our community engagement officers, or our beat officers, supervisors. So it's really a top-down approach. Um, and it is a day-long class that we spend um, time with during our academy now so that our brand new officers are learning that from the very beginning as part of how they interact with people. <clears throat> and that really brings me into one of the things that happened as we were developing and implementing our Safeguarding for Children of Arrested Parents policy. Um, the youth aid at the time and I wanted to create a way to understand what kids were um, witnessing the arrest of their parent. And beyond that, because we knew that um, kind of law enforcement interaction with kids can take on a number of different forms, the kids are witnessing crimes, the kids are the victims of crimes, we also wanted to get a better understanding of what kind of interactions our kids were having with law enforcement. And so we started reading through all of the reports that our officers write every day and cataloging uh, all of the different interactions that our youth, you know, ages zero to 18 have with law enforcement. And one of the things that happened was after a couple of months, we had a couple hundred entries um, and we kind of were extremely overwhelmed, realized that we had this data set and that we were doing nothing about it. Um, and, you know, some of this were, weak old babies um, who were in the middle of parental domestics multiple times um, with police responding to kids that were the victims of assaults, to kids that were running away, um, to kids that were um, being arrested by police uh, for, for other crimes that they were committing, and it just really ran the gamut. 
And so we kind of recognized that we had to do something about it. So we started looking around to see if there was a model that we could find um, at the Bureau for Justice Assistance or the International Association of Police could show us for what law enforcement agencies do with this information. And we came across um, West Virginia's Handle With Care um, program and started looking at that program, reaching out to West Virginia, understanding how they developed it and kind of what all of the nuances are. Um, what we've learned now is that West Virginia started this back in 2015. Um, it is a statewide policy that they have in place for uh, notifications for kids have, who have had interactions with law enforcement and witnessed traumatic events. Um, so in working with them, we started understanding what the program looked like. We reached out to our school district, um, one of our school psychologists, and said, here's what we have going on. Um, we know when kids are having interactions with law enforcement, we know that that's something that would probably be important for you to know because you're having contact with these kids. They're probably having reactions to these interactions that are brought into the school day and that are causing them to act just not like themselves, whether that means they miss a day, whether that means they're acting out, whether that means they're sleeping, they've missed a homework assignment, they're crying. It can look like a thousand different things. But one of the things that we knew the school district was going through at the time um, was some disproportionate minority contacts with their suspensions and their interventions. And so we thought that maybe this would be a way for them to have some context for how their kids were acting. And that if they knew that something had happened the day before, that would at least reduce the possibility that that child would be suspended, given detention, put in in-school suspension, or have any other disciplinary action taken against them. The minute we said that to the school psychologist, she came up with seven different examples of kids that she had had interactions with recently um, who were struggling at school, who had behavioral incidents because something had happened the day before and nobody knew. Um, and they found out from that child before it was too late. So we started working through the school district to figure out what the best way to get this information to them is. And really the idea that West Virginia has is law enforcement provides a name and a date of birth, and that is it. There is no additional identifying information. There's no context to what that child went through in order, in order to protect the child's privacy. Um, because there is a wide range of things um, that we know that our kids see from being displaced from um, a home that's caught on fire, to being a victim of sexual abuse, to having something stolen, to being the victim of a robbery, um, to a number of different things. You know, witnessing parental domestic violence, being part of parental domestic violence. Um, we've had kids find their parents said an overdose. We've had parent kids who have been pressed for their parents' arrest. Um, and and the whole gamut. So it's just the kid's name and date of birth um, that is sent to the school district. And the school district has teams of people in each of their school buildings who receive that notification and essentially have that if the child's acting like something other than themselves. It's not a time for that personnel to reach out to the kid and start questioning them about what happened the day before. It's just kind of that reminder to have in the back of their head if the kid's acting not like themselves and may be in need of some additional intervention. There is an understanding that if the child hits a point where it seems like they need intervention, that trauma-informed um, services will be used, um, that community organizations that practice trauma-informed care will be referral agencies if it seems that the child or the family need additional psychological or mental health interventions. Um, and really, it, it it goes from there. Um, at this point, we know that last year, um, we started this in December of the 2017-2018 school year. And during that year, we had 233 kids that were identified. Um, this year to date, um, we've had 475 kids that have been identified. Um, there are some duplicates in there. We've had 25 kids this school year who have had multiple Handle With Care notifications provided to the school district. Um, and you know, so we know that those kids are, are of greater concern. 
one of the biggest obstacles that we have is that while our um, city school district is large and, and covers most of the kids that attend public schools, we also have a number of charter schools, parochial schools, and private schools that our kids attend. And so at this point, we're trying to figure out as those schools are set up, whether or not they have the resources to be able to provide um, the trauma-informed care that the kids may need if and when it rises to that level, if they have the infrastructure to be able to receive those notifications. Um, and we also have a concern you know, from a level of privacy of the number of different places that we start sending notifications to the more kind of the child's privacy does not get to be protected in the same way. Um, so in terms of, of beyond our regular school district, we have eight charter schools, um, and I believe there's 12 or 13 private and parochials. Um, we do know that we're at about a 60-40 split of 60% of notifications being made and 40% of notifications not being made. And we're trying to determine who those students are what age they are, what school they may go to, so that we're targeting the right schools for the right reasons. We did have one of the charter schools reach out to us, and so we started making those notifications um, in the winter of this school year. Um, but at this point, some of the others have been a little hesitant to join because they just don't know if they can provide the additional services. The other thing that we know is that for non-school age children, there is an incredible gap and there are resources that are needed for those kids. Um, and for us, it's overwhelming that those kids outnumber our school age kids for their interactions with law enforcement. Those kids predominantly are witnessing parental domestic violence, um, are in homes that uh, there may be fires that are happening and they're displaced, um, that there's other issues that are happening within the family where the family is becoming homeless. Um, where there are parents with mental health issues, um, but we know that those kids are in need of services and support. And so we're trying to work with our local community nonprofit agencies to determine a way for those kids to get some of the same um, attention that our school age kids get, because we know if we can provide some of that early intervention, we can get those kids on track developmentally, make sure that any of their needs are being addressed, and also help to train the community um, in what's going on with um, with ACEs and how that affects child development. Um, I think at this time, that's probably the end of, of what I have to say. I know that there was a question about um, other states that are implementing Handle With Care. Um, I know that West Virginia is implementing it. Um, Michigan, parts of New York, um, Maryland, Texas, Florida, and I believe there's about 15 other states that have some form of Handle With Care happening whether it's in one school district, a county, or a number of different counties within the state. Um, they all are a little bit different. Um, I know that even within New York, um, they're all a little bit different depending on what the law enforcement agency is in the setup of the school system. Um, but for more information, you can go to handlewithcarewv.org. Um, that's West Virginia's site. They hold a conference every year, it's fantastic. And there's an incredible amount of information on their site for how this program was developed, um, some of their success stories. Um, it, it really is incredible. Um, so I believe with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our hosts um, for some of the questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Katie and Brendan and Rebecca. Um, that was such helpful information um, from all of you. Um, and I want to encourage everybody on the phone to, uh, if you have questions, to continue um, adding them to the chat box um, on your screen, and we will address them. Um, our first question is for Brendan. Um, if you're an average person in the community who wants to see their police department institute something like this policy, where would you recommend they start? Who should they talk to to build support? So thank you for that question. So, so I'll answer that in two different ways. So the first way is that, you know, if you already know like your beat officer, if you have an officer that, that you're already familiar with, talk to them. Because a lot of times there's uh, champions within the department and especially if there's a community officer that you already have a, 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 a good rapport with, that's a good person to go to. Um, you know, we, we tried to build like a true 
um, community policing model where the officers in the, in the neighborhood could answer all those questions and also could help get those resources. So if folks had those questions, they could get those. But if you don't have that, you know, call the main number. Listen, there's plenty of people would call, um, call my number and they would either talk to my assistant or they would talk to me and, and we would try to get those, that information and certainly get them to the right person. But, uh, if, if you, there's nothing wrong with advocating all the way to the top. Um, so, I mean, if this is something you, you feel strongly about, about in your community, um, there's really nothing wrong with calling the main number of the chief's office and saying, Hey, we're aware of this program and we want to see if our police department's doing it. And if not, who could we talk to within the department? to see if this is something we can get adopted, you know, because a lot of the, a lot of the work is already done. So uh, I say go one of those two paths. If there's somebody you already have a relationship with, talk with them. If not, call the main number and ask, like, who is the person I can speak to here? And if there isn't somebody already that they can connect you with, just ask, you know, hey, can I speak to the chief? I'd like to talk to him about this uh, initiative I'm aware of. Thanks, Brendan. That's really helpful. Um, so when you were chief, what was your elevator speech uh, to gain, you know, quote unquote, elevator speech, your quick three minute synopsis um, to gain buy in for these policy and procedure changes that you were advocating for? You know, it wasn't much different than today. I mean, you know, to, to me, it was when I was talking to police officers, it was like, hey, listen, you know, you're, you're young when you come on, you don't have children. You don't necessarily know how to address those situations, and we're trying to give you the right tools to do that. And then at the end of the day, um, you know, our job is to protect vulnerable people and try to tell me who's more vulnerable than a child. Um, there's, you know, not too many more people that are. So if that's our job, if our job is to help people and to protect the vulnerable, then guess what? That's your job, and you need to do that. And I'm giving you the tools to do it. Um, but I mean, they, they, it's not much different than today. So you know, this, these are the tools that we're providing so you can do a better job. Great. Um, and we have a question that I think would be for Katie, but um, Dr. Schlieffer, Rebecca, you can possibly answer as well. The question is, can you give an example of notifications to schools and how or who decides if the school should take action? make referrals, et cetera, to address the possible needs. Do students have the option to say, no, thank you, or how do you know about my family? You know, what are the privacy issues that come up? That's a question that came in an audience member. Um, I can so, take that one. Um, so really the, the crux of this is in the training. Um, so the school district, identifies a number of key individuals within each building. It's usually a principal, social worker, um, sometimes a nurse, um, and for elementary school aged kids, um, it may be the classroom teacher because the classroom teacher is spending the majority of the day with that child. Um, but again, it's about training. This is not a time when it's it's time for that person to go up to that child and let them know that a notification was made. That is not what is supposed to happen. It's an awareness so that if the child acts unlike themselves, then an intervention can be put in place. And that intervention depends on what is happening with that child. If it's the day where the kid is exhausted and falling asleep in class, the ability for that kid to go to the nurse's office and take an hour long nap, maybe that's all that needs to happen. If it's something where you know, the kid is acting out continuously or there's a behavior pattern that lasts for a number of days um, and the social worker doesn't feel like it's something that can be addressed within the school building. Um, that's when they talk about other interventions, potential community interventions, a communication with the parent, and it's really child focused. You know, we know that your child, we see that your child is not acting like themselves. They're struggling with whatever the actual behavior is. Um, and we think that they may benefit from, you know, talking to somebody, from, you know, tutoring, from whatever it may be that, that can help that child that day. Um, and in terms of, of privacy issues, you know, we had a long discussion when we went to put um, Handle with Care in place about, you know, even sharing the child's name and date of birth. Um, you know, one of our biggest concerns is law enforcement is the only one that's making this notification. So it's clear that there is some law enforcement contact. 
our dream is that at some point it becomes law enforcement, probation, child protective, and parents themselves. Um, because we know that there are kids that are going to be affected because they just found out that their parents are getting divorced, that grandma just died, that somebody just got diagnosed with cancer. And they're going to have some of the same behavioral um, reactions to that, some of the same emotional reactions to that, that is going to interrupt their school day and bring the attention of school personnel. Um, so that's our, our concern around, around privacy issues, and particularly for some of those kids where there are multiple handle with care notifications over a school year. Um, that we know that there is a tendency for people to then kind of look at that kid and go, what is going on with your life? Um, and so that's something that's always in the back of our mind. Um, and, and it's been it's been a work in progress with the school district to have them on board. You know, our school district was in the process of becoming trauma informed as we were. And so this really just kind of fell into place at the right time. But I can't stress how important it is for the school district to understand what ACEs are, the effects of ACEs on kids, and what being trauma informed really means. Thanks, Katie. That's very helpful, too. Um, and, you know, I know at the beginning of the webinar, um, Sherry Hoffman from ASPE mentions the youth.gov website and the information that we have on that website. Um, and some of what you mentioned, um, we have in some tip sheets on that website. So we hope people will go there, too, to look for information um, where we do encourage um, educators and teachers, other people that work with youth, um, to understand more about what's behind some of the behaviors that we may see in kids in school. Um, and so before a punishment, let's say, is given, maybe understanding the what's behind that. So thanks, Katie, for, for reinforcing that. Um, we have a question for Savannah. Um, how did you get connected to your mentor? Um, so there is a program in our children called the Mentoring Program. and it's for all kids who pretty much have any type of troubles with not seeing, like having a long distance from their mom because their moms are in prison or dads. So my mom, Kelly, has a program called Team Program where they pretty much give a mentor to either talk to or go out just to have a little fun in their life and know that they have somebody to talk to and somebody that actually cares about them. Mm -hmm. So you got your mentor through the uh, Our Children, um, Our, like H-O-U-R, Children's Program. And how did you get connected with the Our Children Program? When I was, when my mother was in jail, there was a person named Sister Tisa, and she comes up to the jails and really just talks to the women and sees pretty much how they're, change, how they're gonna change. And my mom did not really think that they were actually gonna come back to visit her and actually give her a new life, but I guess they did and now my mom's here. That's great, thank you. Um, can you tell us more about how being involved with that organization has helped you? both during um, incarceration of your parents and after? Well, some of the things that I participate in is I am in the teen program, which is for almost all teens. Just for some like arts and crafts, it's pretty cool. The mentoring program, which is pretty much so you know that you have somebody to care for you, somebody to take you out, and something somebody to do fun things with. I do therapy with people and our children who actually are, hold, will hold all your secrets. They're a great person to talk to. Um, I also have these things called girl group. And all of my friends who I have known for the longest, most of their mothers went to prison and came to our children. And some somewhat have the same backstory as me. Um, we do a girls group, and we pretty much talk about anything like any any troubles or even if you want to pull them aside and just have your one-on-one -on -one talk they're always great and yeah 
That sounds great, Savannah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a question for Dr. Schlafer. Um, in commonly reported statistics, one may see the number 2.7 million as the number of youth with incarcerated parents. Can you please explain the difference between that estimate and the 1.75 million youth that you mentioned? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've seen um, a number of different estimates pop up in, in different uh, places depending on um, the methods that were used to collect those estimates. Um, so the 1.75 million statistic that I gave was from a report from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and that um, is federal government reporting um, on interviews with a selected and representative group of uh, people in state and federal prisons, so adult and federal prisons at that point in time. And I think uh, those data were collected in maybe 2007. I know the report came out in 2008, so it might be a little bit even older than that. So those data are quite dated at this point in terms of they're more than 10 years old. And so, um, and again, those represent people who were in prison um, at the time of the, that data collection. Um, and I think, Juliet, you had shared um, a different statistic from um, another source of data. And so sometimes we see variation both in terms of whether um, kids are asked retrospectively, have you ever had a parent go to jail or prison? Um, and other times we see data that are collected as a point in time estimate, meaning parents are asked as they're currently incarcerated, do you have children? And so we see depending on who is asked and when they're asked, um, variation in these these data, but I think it's fair to say that the majority of people who are in jails and prisons in this country are parents with minor children, and that millions of children are experiencing the incarceration of their parents um, on any given day. Thanks for clarifying that, Dr. Schaefer. Um, and one more question for you. Um, what developmental signs should caregivers look for that may flag some area of concern? Yeah, and I think Katie did such a nice job of talking about this in terms of how this would look in classrooms, too. Um, really, we would want to be looking out for things like that are really out of the ordinary, you know, that it, this doesn't look like your child's typical behavior. So we know that there's huge variation um, in kids, right? Any parent who's listening today knows that their two children, um, or, or if they have multiple children, that their, their kids are quite different, even in the same household, uh, that you know, I can think about my own son who turned 10 yesterday and just how different he is at 10 years old than he was at eight years old, for example. Um, and part of our job as parents and caregivers is to just pay attention to our kids' behaviors, right? Know that a reaction may not be typical um, and being thoughtful about how we respond to that. And so that could look like uh, major changes that you may see in what we developmental milestones that we have already seen our children achieve. For example, if you saw a child who was already had um, done toilet training, for example, and was using the bathroom regularly um, and not having an issue, right? Let's think about a third grader, for example, and, and always goes to the bathroom when they need to. And then all of a sudden they are constantly wetting themselves or wetting themselves on a regular basis. That would be something that is so atypical and really would give us a red flag for saying what's going on um, with this kiddo. But also Kate, Katie had some great examples about, you know, sleeping in class. If that's not typical for a kid, um, if uh, a kid is more reactive than normal. And so we can think about um, sort of differences across developmental dom domains that look atypical for that child. Um, again, knowing that there's huge variation um, of kids of the same age, even in kids of the same family. So really being attuned to what's typical for, for your child or that particular child. Great, thank you. Um, Let's see, I'm checking to see if more questions have come in. Um, um, for Brendan Cox, um, were officers involved in the developing, development of the training in Albany? So yes, so uh, so we were lucky, you know, the BJA and ISP came in and they asked if we would take part in, uh, in creating the training video. So uh, there was a group of officers that took part in it and are, and are in that video that goes out across the country. And then our, our training unit, 
which has officers in it, were, were involved in uh, developing the policy, which was certainly based on the ISP policy, but it was also um, based on our own our own policies and uh, and and our internal training. So yes, there were, there were officers involved, and that and that's a huge help. Um, that's something we really tried to do with a lot of different policies. That you know, whenever you're trying to to shift the culture, um, you know, when you can do peer to peer training and peer-to-peer -peer involvement in a policy, that, that really helps. That's a huge piece to be able to get that change. Right, that sounds important for getting buy-in. Um, we have another question for Katie about privacy um, and any resistance uh, to identifying students in that way um, that both you and Dr. Schlafer mentioned. Um, and how did you overcome that resistance and what other sort of privacy concerns maybe came up um, or come up for you while you're implementing the handle with care program the the resistance that really came up between us and the school district was around who should have that information um, clearly this is not a everybody in the school district should be given a name of um, students and their dates of birth um, it was really around creating um, a precise way for that information to be delivered. Um, so for us, we send it to essentially our central registration and pupil personnel departments. Um, they provide not only kind of the, the student data, but they also do all the student social and emotional supports um, and some of the programming for, uh, for the district. Um, and so then they determine where that child, what building that child goes to school at, and what the team at that building is that receives that child's information. And again, it's just the name and the date of birth. Um, so there really was no resistance whatsoever. Um, we did do a press conference before, um, before we started the program, we had conversations with our legal teams about whether or not we could even share this information, and there was no doubt that we could. Um, the same thing happened uh, in our conversations with West Virginia. Um, you know, they had the same concerns, and and really, you know, because it's a police interaction, um, it, it's our information to be able to provide, and because there's no identifying information about the incident itself, um, it's information that we can give. The resistance that we had um, was how that student's name and date of birth would be used. And really, I can't understand enough um, that they chose the people in each building because of their knowledge around trauma um, and that they would be able to use this information appropriately and not, you know, possibly good intentions, go up to that kid and try to find out more details. Um, because that child may not be ready to share. It may be a secret that they're trying to hide. Um, and that this is something to kind of have in your tool belt if and only if that child is acting unlike themselves. Okay. Um, because, yeah, I guess the, the thought is that the first question people might ask is, you know, who gave permission for the police to tell the school this information. Um, so again, we're not sharing information about the incident. They're not knowing why um, why that child is getting a handle with care notification. Um, and nothing happens unless the child is acting unlike themselves. Mm -hmm. The context to be able to provide the appropriate interventions for that child. Um, so we know that there are kids that have seen horrific things where the kid kind of is acting exactly like themselves for a really long time and nothing ever happens. But then there are also times where a kid may come to school the next day and be having a horrendous day and a horrendous day the day after that and a horrendous day the day after that. And at this point, it's not just about having a discussion around, you know, Johnny's having a really bad day. You know, we know that something happened and they shouldn't be suspended, but that the conversation with the parent is around 
Johnny's been having a really rough week. We've seen these behaviors. We've seen these behaviors. We think we need to do something because it's affecting his learning. Um, and you know, we really don't want to suspend. We don't want to have any disciplinary action happen. Is there something going on that we can help with? Or is there something that we can provide to you so that the family is getting the support that it needs? So, so this is Brendan. So, so, so if I can just add on for one second. So like one of the one of the strategies that that somebody that would be implementing this would want to do, and and this came in after after I left, but it was it's a strategy that we tried to always go with, and I know that that Kitty was part of making sure the strategy happened, as was the school district is that there will be some community engagement and notification when something like this happens. So there was a lot of education that went around this, that folks knew that this was happening um, and that the community w was not only made aware, but, you know, at different meetings, were, it, this was openly spoken about. And the community, um, I guess I don't want to, I don't want to oversell the input, um, but the community was made aware of it and there was discussions around it. So folks got some education around it. So that way people were more, um, familiar with what was happening so they didn't think like the police were bringing some kind of information to the school district so kids were going to be you know something punitive was happening so people really understood why this was occurring what the scope of it was and that it was simply for to make sure that like if something was going on in the classroom like Katie explained that was different the teacher knew that they could you know would support be more supportive and not do something that would just add on to some trauma that had already happened. Right. Yeah. Thank you for for building off of Katie's response, and Katie, thank you for explaining that so carefully um, and going into that detail. Um, so I think our our last question um, is for Brendan too. Um, and then after Brendan, you answer this. I think I'll pass it back to uh, to Sherry to close us out and and um, finish up this webinar. Um, but our final question for Brendan is. Um, how was the initial reception um, you received from your police department when you first started trying to get others on board with this policy? You know, I I think we had a really good reception. Um, you know, I think I think getting the train, getting the policy itself together was not always the easiest thing. It was definitely, especially when we started talking about asking people when they were being processed in an arrest, whether or not they had a child at home, what steps we were going to take if they said they did. Um, there was a little bit at times of, of uh, frustration at that point. But once we put the policy together and really started getting the training out and, and getting people to understand why we were doing it, I think there was really good reception. I think most of the officers appreciated it. Just like I think that, you know, now that the department's doing the training around ACEs and, and uh, trauma-informed policing that, it's it's very appreciated. I think the officers are, are happy that they're they're finally getting an understanding of how to deal with these situations. That, quite frankly, that's not you know what they thought of when they signed their name on the dotted line. That that all of a sudden they didn't know all of the things they needed to know to actually effectively do their job. So I think overall it's been very positive. That's great to hear, and I think helpful for those on the on the webinar hearing who might want to do this in their communities. Um, uh, to hear that that you had positive reception. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for participating today, and thank you to our panelists. You guys have provided us with a wealth of information on a very important topic. Um, and I'll pass it off to Sherry to to end our webinar today. Thanks so much, Julia. Yeah, <clears throat> that was really interesting. Um, I have loved hearing all of those different perspectives, and I want to thank each of you for bringing um, your experience and your knowledge and your encouragement really um, to this topic. So I want to let folks know that the recording of the webinar will be available shortly on youth.gov. If you know of other folks who you think should listen to it, you'll be able to send that around. And if you haven't um, spent any time on youth.gov, there is a place there that you can sign up for a newsletter that you would get every couple of weeks from us with more information about other webinars and trainings and, and resources that are available um, through youth.gov. So um, we really appreciate your partnership in this work, and thank you for being with us and listening today, and we hope to see you again another time. Thanks so much.
Thank you. The webinar will now conclude.